Um, so this is our title and I, I put on it on, on the lower left part of the screen, an example of a uranium atom fissioning. It hasn't yet split apart. And of course, as we know from earlier talks and thoughts on this subject, that the, the fragments can be, they seem to be probably randomly chosen and they're not equal in size, uh, but they can be scattered over quite a range of the periodic table. The three intense beams, it seems, are representing neutrons. The probability is that with every fission, there can be either two or three neutrons emitted in order to balance the equation of E equals MC squared. The blue that you see in little arcs around the nucleus represent the electron shell um, of, of many layers of uh, electrons. Really, they're much further out than that. That representation is very condensed. And in the background, you can see other uranium atoms and occasionally uh, lights around them as they fission. The reason I'm bringing that to your attention is that there has to be a chain reaction for the probability of one of those two or three neutrons to interact with a nearby atom of uranium and to cause that to fission as well. Now, Fermi uh, worked on that for two full years at the University of Chicago before he got that fission um, to become a chain reaction. Uh, otherwise, it just fizzled out. And so when you want to use um, low enriched uranium in a peaceful way to generate energy, um, it's, it's tricky. And, uh, uh, but he worked hard at it and a very smart man. And that um, is an interesting history that I'm just reviewing with you. The subtitle is what these advanced reactors are, why are they advanced, and why we need them to save our planet. Uh, I just happened to run across this guy, Jack. I think it could be Schoonover or Schoonover. I'm not sure how he pronounces it. Um, but I, I ran across him recently, and I thought I would just share this with you. He says, uh, this is his concluding paragraph, this whole screed from the Friends of the Earth website reminds me of advertising. Um, and he refers to uh, soap products and whether you have a ring around your collar or not. Uh, he says, if you're na naive enough to fall for it, you buy his product. Um, he, he, this is a fairly lengthy article. I didn't send that out to you to read. But um, Robert O. Anderson apparently was CEO of Atlantic Richfield Oil. And he provided a million dollars in the time, way back in 1969, to create uh, Friends of the Earth. This is a website that attacks nuclear energy um, like nothing else. It's even worse than Greenpeace. And Jack, his last sentence was, boy, has he gotten his money's worth? Because this uh, negativism and any nuclear attitude has pervaded so many sites that are green today um, hard to imagine the Sierra Club used to be very pro-nuclear and gradually it actually fissioned and spread into two groups and eventually the anti-nuclear people won. Um, but uh, I think it's, it's really quite remarkable the antipathy to nuclear energy uh, that still persists today, partly because I think the oil industry is terrified of nuclear energy that uh, we, it will um, cut them off faster than they'd like to be. And uh, it turns out that the pandemic is doing that much more effectively perhaps than nuclear ever would, but uh, uh, the websites persist. And, and I use that as an introduction to last week's slide. Dr. Desai gave a wonderful talk, I thought, and this was one of his, I'm not sure what it was in the sequence, but I think it was one of his later slides. Uh, he got it from drawdown.org. And I present it here because uh, as I looked at it, I thought these are some sort of 
uh, factors, gigatons of CO2 equivalent that would be reduced by doing these various things, reducing food waste, we talked about that, health. And education obviously relates to population control, plant-rich diets, and so on. And, and it turns out that there are four of them involved with electricity. One is onshore wind. Um, another is utility scale. That would be um, large solar fields, such as at Maury's Airport. Um, then there's a distributed photovoltaics down um, here. And that would be on the rooftop, I think mostly. And then way down at the bottom, concentrated solar power, which of course are these gigantic, um, not so much photovoltaic, but reflected sunlight heating up uh, oil, and that in turn um, uh, providing electricity in a, in a turbine of sorts. So, but, but I wondered as I looked at this, well, where's nuclear? You know, that should be in here somewhere. And so then I, I persisted and um, uh, to look at it, it was a really neat website. You went through all of these things. And if you go on it, I invite you to do it. It's remarkably detailed. But and it, it took me a long time to find nuclear power. But eventually I did. I was a bit disappointed when I got to this section. It says nuclear power is slow, expensive, risky, creates radioactive waste. Oh, yeah, but it has the potential to avoid emissions from fossil fuel electricity. I sort of admitted that later on as the last line. And then over here, this I found totally meaningless, this impact business. Didn't understand it at all, or hardly at all. And then over here, I noticed in the second line, when somebody writes this, you know that they're gonna be negative. It is the most complex process ever invented to boil water. Yeah, it is, uh, but that's not why it was invented. Uh, it just happens that when we have heat, it's the easiest way to convert it to electricity at the moment. Uh, there may be better ways later on. And then it goes down to the last paragraph. At Project Drawdown, we consider nuclear a regrets solution. It has potential to avoid emissions, but there are many reasons for concern. Deadly meltdowns. Well, it turns out the two meltdowns that we've had at Three Mile Island and at Fukushima were not deadly, nobody was killed. Tritium releases, which are trivial, unless in very high concentration in some big cans in, in uh, Fukushima, and those are not gonna be concentrated much longer. They'll be released into the ocean where it'll be quite harmless, very weak beta emitter. Abandoned gold mines, that was kind of funny. It's nice if some of them are abandoned. It means we're using nuclear warheads more and mines less. And then mine tailings pollution, which is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, radioactive waste we've talked about many times and that is a problem. Illicit plutonium trafficking. It's something that we have bad dreams about, but we've never really heard of it actually happening. And then thefts of missile material. That, that's a dandy. Haven't heard of that one before as a problem with peaceful nuclear plants. So that is way out there. Anyway, I do recommend it otherwise. There's another group called Voices of Nuclear. I was intrigued by this group. I wanted to find out who they were. So I went on their website and I found that members are Barack Obama, James Hansen, Mark Linus, Dalai Lama, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, um, Richard Branson, John Kerry, James Lovelock, and others. So it seems like a pretty illustrious group and they have put together a, this website. Um, and they've noticed in it <clears throat> down in the lower right here that there are a lot of these orange dots and they relate to political reasons. And when you get down into the political reasons in greater depth, uh, most of them have to do with um, uh, anti-nuclear activity, um, uh, public negativism, uh, opinions about it. And so we need to look into this and um, think about the fact that our nuclear fleet is aging and we are gonna have to think about replacing them. In the United States, since we started the whole thing. Uh, we don't have very many young reactors, less than 10 years. Um, uh, there are a number that, that are 10 to 30 years, but a vast majority of them are over 30 years of age. And I think that's kind of a cool thing because instead of having to take them down as we do the wind turbines and solar panels after 20 years or less, uh, sometimes a bit more, um, they're there. They, can, they were designed for 40 years. They've been renewed, some of them twice. So they're going for 80 years and who knows how much longer. I think it depends a bit on the 
uh, durability and, and functionality of the concrete that was used at the time. Then the European fleet is almost as old. And then as we go through the other countries, Russia, Japan, and Korea, and so on, they get a bit younger. In China, they're youngest of all uh, because they've just, uh, they're still building coal plants in China, but also some nuclear plants and they have quite a, a young fleet there. It's something we need to keep in mind. How are we going to replace those? Are we just gonna uh, replace them by leaving open pastures? Well, this is what's been happening um, in the United States. Over on the left side, we see that there are 19 shutdown sites and 21 reactors over the past decade or so. We can um, recall uh, this one in La Crosse, Wisconsin, uh, Zion in Illinois. These are in the process of being decommissioned. Some of them are in a stage called Safe Store. I had no idea what IFC is, but it stands for Independent Spent Fuel Storage Installation. And of course, we have a bunch of them slated for decommissioning over the next five years, uh, including Diablo Canyon, although I think that will probably be reversed. And so we'll, we'll see about that. But uh, it's, it's concerning. Well, let's look at where they are within the United States. And you notice some dark blue ones indicate where they've been closed. But look at all the light blue ones. These are ones that were where the closures were announced, but they were reversed much to my delight. And you can see there are four along the bottom, two along the side, or three along the side, and three along the top. So that makes a good 10 of them. And I'm really pleased to see that. I think Michael Schellenberger should be given some credit for some of these reversals. He's really worked hard on that. Um, so in the bottom, it summarizes as 13,000 megawatts were preserved um, of the 20,000 that were prematurely retired. So that's uh, encouraging. Um, but preserve for how long? That's the big question. Um, the other thing that we need to be frank about uh, is closures and waste. Now the public really doesn't realize, I think, that uh, there are a number of commercial sites. These are the ones in dark blue. The red triangles are a Department of Energy sites where they've been doing usually some research uh, the big, most famous one is the Idaho National Laboratory, uh, INL. Uh, the Hanford site is much more for weapons, but they, uh, they have had uh, a lot of cleanup to do there. So we were learning how to clean up uh, a bad job when they uh, left uh, some highly radioactive materials uh, improperly um, buried at the Hanover site, and they're still cleaning them up, although they're making some pretty good progress there. And then finally, we have the Red Star at Yucca Mountain in Southern Nevada, um, which has been, um, I understand, as I understand it, built ready for, for um, use, but uh, uh, blocked uh, by former President Obama for political reasons. Um, so it's an interesting map, and I think we need to uh, be candid with the public about uh, why and how is this nuclear waste uh, stored? Well, there are stages of decommissioning and this uh, uh, one at Crystal River, I'll have to show you where Crystal River is. Right here in Northern Florida. And um, they have, uh, Duke Energy has put up this on their website uh, as examples of the stages for the for the first 20 um, decontaminated began this year they were planning it and they're going to remove the components for the next six years shrink the regulated land area uh, because it's huge and demolish all structures except the dry cask storage facility which I'll show you in the next slide uh, they'll continue operating and maintaining the dry cask storage facility for the next 17 years and then after 2037, they're dreaming at least of this happening. I'll be a bit skeptical if it turns into something this lovely, but uh, it might. Anyway, it's a, an interesting idea. Um, and I wanna show you the dry cask storage because this uh, is what, what's been happening since 1986. Dry storage 
has released no radiation that has affected the public or contaminated the environment. And that's, uh, we're talking 34 years ago. There has been no known or suspected attempts to sabotage these facilities. The tests on the fuel casks and components after years of dry storage confirm that they're providing safe and secure storage. Now, of course, the, um, before the, the reactors are decommissioned, they, they stay, the sources stay in water for one to five years before they cool down enough that they can be stored in these dry casks. But there's no electricity needed. It's all done by uh, cooling, by convection, and they're just checked periodically by individuals at most of the sites where uh, nuclear reactors have been decommissioned. Uh, there's sufficient um, um, licenses and, and so on are, are carried out to maintain the inspection. And this, of course, is potential fuel for uh, generation four reactors, as we've discussed uh, quite a bit before. Um, so how can we combat fear? Um, nuclear power, that they say, is risky, and yet clearly it has a wonderful track record when compared with most other common sources of, of electricity. Fear seems to dominate public opinion based on poor understanding, acceptance of the green rhetoric, and big oil just loves our continued ignorance. Um, so how did negative, uh, how, how did, um, we get so negative about nuclear energy. I think we tend to forget that um, um, a little uranium pellet, which is um, about a centimeter um, or so tall and um, less than that in diameter, has the potential to release as much energy as 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas, 149 gallons of oil, or a ton of coal. Just one little pellet, and as you know, these pellets are put into um, little canisters of zirconium, and they um, are packed in such a way so that they end up in an assembly that's about four meters long and go down into the water cisterns of the, of the reactors. So there are a lot of these pellets and generate uh, a great deal of energy. So why does the media ignore nuclear? It is, seems to have become a taboo topic. When we talk about clean energy, we talk about um, hydroelectricity, we talk about solar and wind, and sometimes geothermal, and then we bring in this horrible alternative that seems to qualify called uh, burning wood chips or otherwise known as, as um, bio, I'm forgetting the name now, I'm so negative on the topic. Um, anyway, biofuels, I think is the term we use, but no, but rarely does the word nuclear come up. And it shows this poor fellow here who, who wants to talk about established facts and, and there's nobody there interested and uh, all these unsupported claims. And I, I, I'm not opposed to wind and solar, but, but the problem is that they do not support their claims. They do not talk about um, waste. They do not talk about the need to recycle and occasionally talk about, well, the batteries will be around to deal with intermittency, but they don't seem to really deal very well, in my opinion, with the limitations of uh, clean energy, and they just avoid like the plague, the word nuclear. The only time I see nuclear mentioned these days is when uh, McConnell talks about the nuclear option, which is not a very positive way to think of the word. This is another example of the press's obsession with the negative aspects of nuclear energy. Here is where the earthquake took place on March the 11th, 2011. And you'll notice that Fukushima, there's the Daiichi and the Dain, and they're next to one another, but nobody ever mentions Anagawa. I didn't even know that it was their <clears throat> nuclear plant there much closer. And this just came out in the press recently that this power is back on and everything's just fine because uh, unlike um, Fukushima, where they, uh, <clears throat> they broke the rules and lowered it so that it was close to the water level. In this case, they had a, a sizable 
barrier here, so well above the ocean. So when the tsunami came along, it didn't inundate it. In fact, um, they went to great lengths to open up some of their buildings for uh, families with their children to come and um, be fed and clothed um, while some of the supporting areas were damaged by the um, power down and some um, uh, tsunami related damages to their homes in the vicinity. But uh, the power company, which is a different one than TEPCO, which stands for Tokyo Electric Power Company, and they were very helpful instead of overreacting and um, first of all, withholding information and then uh, delaying cooling of the reactors with ocean water um, and, and moving way many more people than necessary out of the area. Um, this group was very supportive and we only hear about it now, um, nine years later, uh, the success of that area. Uh, the press is totally focused on the failure at Fukushima, which was many fold. So I think that's um, an interesting uh, new bit of press. Now recently, um, I went to a different Plato group. Uh, it's called Global Affairs and they meet on Wednesday morning. And um, there was a presentation uh, by 350.org and they talked very well. The, the speaker was had taken Al Gore's course and she gave wonderful slides. Uh, but when she got to nuclear power, she said, well, I really don't know much about that. I got this information from the Union of Concerned Scientists. And as you all know, um, most of them are not scientists. The one uh, nuclear expert there um, is quite negative about nuclear. And so uh, the, the four facts that she got from, from him or the website was uh, uh, that it faces substantial, two of the four, substantial economic challenges, and that's very true, uh, but then carries significant human health and environmental risks. And uh, one of the members of that group, um, I got up and, and warned the speaker that I was in the audience and I stayed quiet, but I did um, write to her afterwards in center of this, uh, this uh, series of slides. And uh, she wrote back and was very kind and appreciative of the information and said she would invite uh, 350.org to invite me to come and, and give the talk, but I'm, I haven't yet uh, had that pleasure, but I look forward to it should uh, that be in the, in the future. So that's just uh, an example of some of the issues that nuclear is getting. And it's too bad that um, uh, this, uh, these words, I think mostly come from Margie Kendig. Um, she lifted these four points, which I think are very effective. Nuclear power has the fewest deaths per unit of generation of any source of electricity. More people die every day from burning fossil fuels than have died in 60 years from nuclear power. There have been no deaths in the US from nuclear power and fewer than 50 worldwide. And that uh, it's prevented, this is a quote from James Hansen, a paper that he wrote uh, indicating that it's prevented an estimated 1.8 million deaths as a result of replacing coal and oil in some of these dreadful um, uh, products, particularly coal, which um, spoil the air and give particulate pollution that contributes to serious respiratory disease. So let's move into the positives. Um, a lot of people talk about how it's 20% of the grid, but it's really oh, well over 50% of all carbon free electricity. If you just forget about the fossils, then it's a huge part, over half of it is from nuclear. And yet we ignore this N word that uh, just doesn't come into the conversation about clean energy. There are health and environmental benefits because when these plants close, uh, the health and economic benefits are lost. Uh, they employ a good number of workers at each plant who earn uh, uh, higher than average salaries. Uh, good revenue from people who live nearby and work uh, nearby, as well as uh, uh, lots of uh, money paid in taxes annually. So these are something that uh, we should think about before we rush to close down um, any more plants. Now you've seen this slide several times, so I'll go over it quickly, but uh, it, it is useful to look at the dates down here and see that during the 50s, and it was mostly in the later 50s, 
uh, shipping port, I think was started in 1958. Um, and I think this is in Illinois, and this was in near Chicago. So on, so these were the very first few, and very gradually we got into generation two. The LWR stands for light water reactor, as opposed with deuterated water um, that the uh, CANDU from Canada uses. And within that family of light water reactors, there are pressurized water and boiling water. The boiling water ones just work at 100 degrees centigrade, of course, and, but if you pressurize the unit, then you can bring that up to over 300 centigrade and, and that's more efficient thermodynamically. And then we're gonna spend most of our time talking about these three uh, things here, uh, advanced light water reactors in generation three. Uh, we're gonna talk about this transition through small modular reactors, and then it's merging in some cases into generation four. So that's our plan for the rest of the uh, hour. So these are the old fashioned ones. Votal is the classic uh, example in, um, uh, I think it's in, can't remember now, I think it's in South Carolina. Uh, I get the com too confused because they're not far apart. The um, summer one I think was in Georgia and that was discontinued, but fortunately they, they did finish this one, but it's really anachronistic. It was designed way back in the 40s, basically from the time of Fermi. Uh, the land print is too large. It's expensive over an engineered post Fukushima, and they only utilize uh, one to 2% of the uranium that's put in there before it has to be removed again. And uh, these two units, um, there are two well-established units, one and two there, uh, but these large ones will not be run before uh, next year or the year after. So uh, it's taken about 10 years to build them. Other examples of, of so-called advanced reactors are the EPRs, which stands for European Pressurized Reactors. They're um, designed by a consortium, Arriva, EDF, and Siemens about 20 years ago. Some are running uh, in China, UK, India, Belarus, but many were canceled uh, in Canada, Czech Republic, Finland, and elsewhere. And these bottom three are over the, the images here. This one is quite famous, Flamaville, you may have heard of. One in Finland, very difficult to pronounce name, I won't try. And one in England at Hinkley Point. Um, just showing you a little bit about Flamaville. Uh, here is the, an interesting graph based on the announcement times in open circles and the time of commissioning. When they originally thought of the idea, in 2007, they thought, well, it'll take seven years. And they had to keep changing the dates and the cost. You notice the ordinate here is in billions of euros. So the cost had to go up as they would uh, announce that it would take uh, another longer period of time. And now we're up to um, 2019. And uh, I think it might be even a little bit before that. I don't think Flamingville is yet quite up and running. Um, but look at the delay. It's 15 years now instead of seven. Uh, and the cost has gone up over threefold. So it is a problem. And it, the, these um, uh, generation three reactors have really given the cost est idea and delays in manufacturing a bad name. The only exception is Belarus. They uh, they have a very dictatorial government, as you well know from uh, the news these days, and they have one plant with two Russian units of a, over a thousand megawatts each, and it produces a third of their electricity. I don't imagine there was anybody around who dared to object, um, uh, and so uh, that went in and is doing very well. Uh, Russia, as you can see, is very close to Belarus and Ukraine, uh, in spite of uh, um, Chernobyl was right about there. And so they must have had a pretty bad experience with that, although that was 35 years ago now, or 34. But uh, they did it anyway, and they're doing fine. Now, comparing nuclear capacity and influence with three countries here, China, Russia, and the United States, it's interesting to look at the domestic builds versus the international builds. You can see that China with the young fleet has been building 40 reactors in the last 20 years or so. Russia, 16. United States only three, but the international bills have been pushed, of course, by, by Putin, who encourages Rosatom to build around the world, and that's been working pretty well. Uh, we have another way of looking at that with the circular 
figure where Russia dominates with 37% of new nuclear reactors, China 28, Korea and France still well ahead of us. And, and how did four other countries get ahead of us who invented it all? Uh, well, yes, the cost is a problem, although um, we're not the poorest country in the world. Some people say we're the richest, I'm not sure. Uh, fear is definitely a factor. And politics, I think, the strongest factor of all. The oil lobby has really worked on the public. Well, what can we do? What, we, what do we need now to do? And that is to have these small modular reactors. Uh, their operation can be based on generation two or four technologies, and I'll go into that. So that's not the criterion. Um, neither is the size, although the vast majority are less than 300 megawatts of electricity. The key things is that they can run independently without active cooling or any offsite power, and they're small enough to have the entire reactor module fabricated at a central facility. By doing that and having them shipped by rail or truck to the site of assembly, can reduce costs and assembly time considerably. Um, so that's a huge advantage. If you imagine one of these, and we're using the new scale one here as an example, just imagine two school buses stacked end to end. And also keep in mind that this is all underground. Uh, so basically it's a huge change in how the generation three reactors are built. It's really a wonderful transition. So SMRs are small, they're scaled to fit the need. They can replace a single coal plant or provide power in remote areas such as Puerto Rico, for example, um, or other islands offshore. SMRs are modular, so they can be mass produced as mentioned, and they can cool themselves by natural convection. Huge, huge advantages uh, that we're finally getting into. So this is an image of an underground new scale reactor, all self-contained. The red lines are the hot water steam lines and that go and drive a turbine with uh, uh, some cooling from here, the generator here sending off the electricity to uh, um, uh, the um, turbines up above ground. And uh, this is an example of where the um, sorry, an engineer's drawing on the left, an artist's sketch on the right. <clears throat> but if the uh, reactors are banked and there can be anywhere from um, two to uh, a dozen here, there might be six uh, along. So this is an example of 12 new scale small modular reactors, six on each bank. And the ones on this side are sending out the steam to these turbines here, other ones on this side sending out to the steam turbines there. And then the, um, the yards for, um, I need my glasses to read some of this fine print. Uh, these are the switch yards off here and the uh, uh, cooling towers on either side here. Um, so it, it's a neat uh, system and uh, they've made it a little more presentable here next to a river in this drawing. Um, uh, there are some people who wanted to make sure that we're aware of the disadvantages. They do make some wonderful advances. But the disadvantages mentioned here are that they're still, because it's water cooled, uh, <coughs> because it's water cooled, there's poor fuel, fuel utilization, only 2% or so, no recycling of that fuel, uh, there's no breeding, and the temperature, even with the uh, certain elevated pressure, is still limited to 300 degrees centigrade with a fairly low efficiency. So we have to look at that that side of it as well. Um, this is an example of the controls. Uh, this is uh, Lee and Dottie who came with me and Kirk and we visited this Byron plant a few years back. And this was a huge room about the size of this, uh, but managed with uh, the occasional TV screen and a lot of toggle switches and some uh, feedbacks in little things like that. And so no wonder it took a lot of people to run it. Here uh, in this, um, both of these are setups. They're not real plans. At this particular one, it was a place where they trained people. And uh, when we were there, they actually went through a three mile island like scenario of a, of a broken valve and how they diagnosed it for us because we had graduate students from nuclear engineering there as well. Uh, and this one, they, uh, this is also a setup uh, in um, Oregon. 
so, but it's a very different image. And the idea is that you can, with fewer people, uh, control it better than the old generation two versions. Rolls Royce has come up with a, a pretty impressive way of, of setting up those same sorts of things that I discussed. Theirs is a little more energetic, it goes from up to 400 megawatts, but look at that, isn't that an incredible looking thing? Very, very different from the industrial looks of uh, today. Looks like a giant cocoon of some sort. Um, Rolls has really gone out to have a develop a consortium. And you can see here by these uh, logos that they're working with the Welding Institute in Cambridge, the Manufacturing Technology Center in Coventry, uh, many other universities. And they're anticipating significant global markets, even uh, 10,000 megawatts of, of, uh, of Rolls-Royce units in the United States. They think they might sell some to Canada and look at all these other places, China and so on. Uh, so they're, they're optimistic, uh, so much so that uh, even within their own country, they plan to uh, not only get rid of the coal here in black, but also um, uh, the gas, the methane here. And that will be replaced to some degree by the green, which is a gas with carbon capture and storage. But both of these will be, um, although they've got a little bit more there, but look at the nuclear, this is the orange. And um, uh, this is the first time I've seen anything nearly so optimistic uh, between now and 2050 for the use of nuclear, and this is a gigawatt scale here. Uh, so I hope that their marketers are not uh, smoking something and that that uh, turns out to be real. Well, we talked a lot about SMRs. Of course, the Russians are the ones who have actually done it. The rest of us still have it in the drawing boards. Not only have they done it, but uh, they had it commissioned a year ago. And uh, as of May of this year, uh, they moved it from Mur Murmansk to other places along the Arctic. It's refueled every five years. There are two water-cooled reactors of 70 megawatts each, giving um, uh, 300 of heat and 140 of electricity. They think it should last the whole unit for about 40 years from start as the other reactors have been on land. It's the first operating SMR and the first floating atomic plant in the Arctic. So that's uh, nice to see uh, their success. And the Koreans have gotten into it. They've got this uh, fairly well developed and they expect to be going. Now this slide, you may recall, in spite of the blackouts that I had from uh, last spring when I tried to present this, I think I showed you this slide and you can see that uh, here's the Russian one, uh, a floating reactor. There are three um, American ones. Um, not a very good ratio here between thermal and electric capacity. We usually think of it as not such a high ratio as this. Um, but uh, uh, here's one in Argentina, and I got a kick out of this French one. This is this is underwater. Um, uh, so there, here's one from China. So there are several, but that's that's six months ago. Uh, and look at today. Um, since then, I've gone back and found that there are six classes of SMR, just as there are six classes of Gen 4 reactors, which we'll go to later. Not only are they land-based. Uh, but marine-based water-cooled. And then you can have high-temperature gas-cooled ones. This is uh, helium is a gas. The problem I have with that is that helium is a small atom and uh, without extremely good welding, uh, leaks do develop. Um, they didn't have very good luck with this. Uh, it often uses these little pebbles, the pebble beds. And uh, they have problems with this in Germany with both their reactors, but in Africa, They've, South Africa, they've continued, and now in Indonesia and uh, China, they're working with it. Uh, these are the uh, designed a long time ago, uh, fast neutron spectrum. So this is now a, a small modular, but instead of water cooled, it's sodium, molten sodium cooled and uh, has fast neutrons. Uh, the molten salt we've talked about before and Thorcon is making, as well as other countries, terrestrial, and then we have the very small ones. Uh, Aurora, I showed you a picture of last time, made by Oklo, and there are other companies as well. So that's really encouraging. And I just found this slide recently in a Gen 4 webinar uh, showing the designs around the world. It's really quite incredible. Um, here we have 24 different land-based 
water-cooled reactors. Um, can do in Canada is even making one. And we have new scale up here. Then we have these micro reactors. I mentioned Aurora just a minute ago. Uh, the fast reactors based on uh, sodium. And then we have the high temperature gas cooled ones with uh, these are pebble bed with helium. And then we have the marine based ones. And this of course is the Russian one. Um, and um, I think that's Russian too, shelf, I'm not sure of these others. And then the molten salt reactors, and we'll get into that soon. Thorcon is the one that I'm most familiar with. So things are really happening uh, just in the last few months. And these are some of the designs pictured uh, on the left here, Europe and UK, Asia in the center, Africa down here, North and South America over here. So really quite impressive. And I think these designs are not just empty designs. I know there's a lot of competition and we need to get more uniform in their design but surely some of them will uh, uh, move ahead uh, fairly quickly. Here is some examples of some of them under, under, uh, that are deployed. Another view of the Russian one, this one from uh, um, China and this one from Argentina. Now, another thing I wanted to bring out to you is the, the greater safety margin. We talk about the emergency planning zone or EPZ. And you can see with the traditional pressurized water reactor, and this is, uh, you know, if you're dealing with uh, a number of atmospheres, 16 atmospheres or so, and if that should blow up, uh, you have the fuel cladding, you have the reactor, and you have the containment, the vessel, and then the containment dome. And because that could theoretically, under some circumstances, maybe uh, uh, lead to some release of radioactivity, they've designed an emergency planning zone of 10 miles. But now with all of these uh, extraordinary barriers and placing it underground, uh, the state site boundary is about one tenth or less of that with better accident mitigation, reduced core damage frequency and smaller volumes. So uh, that will um, make them easier to install at uh, numerous sites, uh, some islands offshore and that sort of thing. Also, they want to point out that with regard to climate change, uh, we can integrate with solar in particular, with wind as well, and um, uh, provide electricity for the grid, but also provide heat for industry, um, for making hydrogen and for storing um, hydrogen, um, for various other interactions that I'll talk about later. Um, um, desalination, oil and gas reforming, hydrogen production, ammonia production, all kinds of things. And once we begin to become aware of this, we can use the, the nuclear as base load, but more fluctuating base load because they're smaller and easier to manipulate and uh, dealing with um, solar and wind when it's needed. Um, now, let's just go back a few minutes and touch on these slides. I've shown these to you before. But Enrico Fermi, I think, deserves uh, to be remembered to you and Walter Zinn, um, who did a lot to uh, develop the experimental breeder reactor one. If you get a chance to get out to Idaho, be sure to see this magnificent museum that's out there. I wanted to show you uh, where it all started. 1951, that was before we developed our first light water reactor, or not we, but um, um, my dear hero of submarines, uh, um, I'll think of him in a minute. You all know his name, Rickover, Admiral Rickover. And um, they used uh, sodium and potassium here. Uh, Russia used mercury. Most of them followed with um, sodium. Russia used uh, lead bismuth, a wonderful um, metal combination for high temperatures uh, in their submarines. So they were used uh, basically over 400 operating years in 27 different research reactors. These are not commercial, they are research, but a lot of experience gained. And basically what they did was they harvested the neutrons uh, that came out from the initial fission reaction and they utilized them in this green pattern here. This is a, an arithmetic scale going down here and in terms of the flux of neutron energy and it's decay or lowering as you go left in logarithms. So within a logarithm or so, this energy is still used in the sodium fast reactor. 
because with sodium, uh, the interaction with the neutrons at high energy uh, allows the chain reaction to continue. But in water, um, water in interacts much better with these neutrons when the energy is low. And so even though Rick overtrained uh, with uh, uh, the experts at Oak Ridge, he wanted, Rickover initially wanted to use sodium in his submarines. And uh, uh, they persuaded him with some difficulty not to do that because uh, even though it's nice and efficient, sodium doesn't react very well with either air or water. And so they felt that it would be much safer to use water as a moderator. And so they did. And then a few years later, when Eisenhower wanted to catch up with the Russians who had the first uh, um, peaceful nuclear reactor, uh, he ordered uh, Rickover to build one within two and a half years, and he did. But of course, he needed the, the water because he was used to that as a moderator, and that's how shipping port was built. So, uh, and we've stayed with it ever since. So here we're comparing then light water reactor and sodium fast reactors. This is the first of two slides from the Gen 4 International For Forum. And you can see that these neutrons then are faster by about a million fold uh, than these ones over here. Uh, higher fissile density, higher fuel burnout. This is really key. It burns literally all the fuel. We don't have hardly any waste. The only waste we have from these are, are virtually is, is the uh, fission uh, fragments. Uh, the coolant then is sodium versus water, um, higher boiling point of in the almost 900 degrees centigrade, but it's at atmospheric pressure and uh, a much higher chemical reactivity uh, as opposed to um, the higher pressures needed for light water. So um, this, you've seen this slide before, um, and I want to focus, last time I, I talked about all of these six families. This time I'm going to simplify things. We basically talked already about the sodium fast reactors. So I'm going to skip these and jump down to molten salt reactors because I think they're most important. And what I really want to focus on are the ones that have close fuel cycles. That is, uh, they continue to burn these materials, um, burn in the sense of, um, of the chain reaction uh, continues and it doesn't uh, uh, accumulate as waste. Um, as I say, there is some waste still, but primarily uh, in fission fragments, not as uh, initial fuel. So the use of then of a liquid fuel dissolved in a molten salt is that it avoids complex fuel loading. And it, uh, I think it's very neat that the heat is directly passed into the transfer fluid. It doesn't have to go through the zirconium wall. And, uh, uh, damage that and sometimes with the high uh, uh, radiation fluxes. Also, I think it's nice that you can reprocess the fuel because it's liquid. You do not have to shut the reactor down. And there is a very important gas. Um, one of the fission products is xenon and that uh, is a poison for further reactions. It, 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 it negatively impacts uh, the chain reaction and it, because it's an inert gas, it can be har harvested and uh, allow this to continue without interruption. Also, most important of all, there's a freeze valve there so that if things should get out of uh, control for any reason uh, due to some blocked pipe or something, um, uh, the, the valve will, the temperature goes up, this valve will thaw and a holding tank specially designed to hold it and stop the reaction is present. There's some other advantages here, the typical waste is uh, uh, less than 100 pounds or a half a square foot over 30 years. Uh, it's pretty impressive for a thousand megawatt reactor. Compare that with coal and you have a, a huge difference. The plutonium waste is only a thousandth that of a light water reactor. And um, uh, I think perhaps that's why Al Gore uh, shut them down in uh, uh, the sodium cooled one back in uh, 1994. Um, it's too bad. They felt they didn't need it anymore because they weren't making plutonium, so they weren't very interested in it. Uh, molten salt reactors automatically throttle down as the atoms are, get warmer and they thermally expand and prevent this meltdown. Higher temperatures uh, give better efficiency 
And also it can be fueled by either thorium or uranium. Other reactors can too, to some degree, but this design is uh, highly adaptable to using thorium as a fuel and thorium has some significant advantages. So the molten salt companies in North America are six or seven here. Um, mentioned, notice uh, Bill Gates very actively involved now uh, in several um, avenues. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, I mentioned Lars Jorgensen with Thorcon. Um, I enjoy his work because not only is it uh, relating to shipbuilding, uh, which I think is an important way to scale it up, but uh, he's the only one who answers my emails. And so that's kind of nice. Um, this is a good joke. I couldn't resist this one. Um, uh, they're going out for a date and the woman is saying, you know, I'm sure you're a nice man, but I'm not interested in hearing about thorium. Uh, there's, a, there's a lovely humor in that cartoon. Um, <clears throat> people who have read either one of these books uh, know that there's a lot of thorium information there. And unless you're a real thorium enthusiast, it can be a, a bit much for uh, at least to share with your first date, perhaps. So the other thing I wanted to mention here is that thorium is the fuel. It's not the reactor. The molten salt reactor is the tool to use the fuel. Um, I don't want to say it's the only tool, but it, I, they do go together uh, very well. Um, this just shows you some of the new things that are happening within the field of the liquid fuel molten salt reactor. It can work at lower uh, uh, neutron energies called thermal neutrons, as well as fast neutrons and different types of fuel can be set up here. I won't go into the details, but or you can also use either fluoride or chloride salts. But look at all these companies, uh, Thorcon, Terrestrial, uh, TerraPower, you've heard of these, uh, just incredible, all these different uh, companies getting on the bandwagon. And uh, we do have to be careful that we don't get too many, but I think um, uh, at least we will have alternatives to pick and choose from. Now I'm gonna just touch base a few minutes near the end of our talk with comparing nuclear versus renewables. Um, we, we really need to be honest with one another. Nuclear needs to be honest. Uh, we do have problems with the waste and we have to, to deal with that, but I think there are solutions there. I think that the solar and wind people ought to be more honest with uh, the fact that it requires, the, the capacity factors are significantly lower. The amount of space is considerably higher in terms of square miles for a typical wind uh, field, solar field versus nuclear. Uh, that, that's one issue that we need to be honest with one another about. This is the, uh, they say that nuclear plants cost a lot. Well, they do, and they also cost a lot to build, but look at the materials per terawatt hour. Uh, huge amount of steel in solar. I never thought of that. I've got them on my roof. I never thought there was that much steel up there, uh, but there is, there's certainly no concrete. I think this must be, this our cement, um, this must be used for some solar fields or something like that, or possibly for concentrated solar, but it just says solar photovoltaic. But I'm surprised, I even doubted this figure. I got it from Michael Schellenberger. So I wrote to him and asked him to give me the raw data on which it was based and he did send it to me. And it was more complicated in various tables, but I was able to corroborate that, that the data looked to be sound. Uh, Hydro, of course, has a lot of concrete uh, wind does too for the basis of the tower. Uh, but look at this tiny amount of concrete per terawatt hour and steel for nuclear. It's really quite remarkable. Um, we need to be honest about that. The other thing is the, uh, the third point is the waste. Um, I may have shown you this slide before, but basically uh, we've generated only 80,000 tons of waste over 60 years. And most of this is spent fuel, which has the potential to be reused if we should choose to do so. The United States is one of the very few countries not to reuse their, their, um, their nuclear fuel. Uh, we seem to think we have this big country and we can bury it at uh, Yucca Mountain, but then the politics get in the way. And so we have all of this uh, uh, stuff sticking around that we call waste, which isn't waste at all, uh, because we've chosen um, an open fuel cycle that is, uh, it, um, just keeps accumulating. And 97% um, of this material is reusable. Only 3% is 
are the fission products. And these are high level radioactive waste. Need to be dealt with at places like Yucca Mountain, but, uh, but we need to get over the politics too. So it's not uh, necessarily nuclear's fault, it's the fault of the politicians that are slowing it down. Finally, as ground transportation, and we're gonna be discussing that as a group next week, switches from polluting gas and oil to electricity, we're going to need nuclear power to fill in for that. Uh, we don't, surely cannot make uh, enough solar and wind energy to, uh, or, or hydro even, to charge up all the cars that are gonna be charging. Also, I think we can um, convert our diesel engines out of ships. I would like them all to be nuclear. Um, and we can also make hydrogen for hybrid power and commercial aircraft. So with the fuel cells. So I think that's uh, uh, really important that we include nuclear. So I come to this slide near the end here. Nuclear is getting into bed with renewables. We shouldn't be fighting each other. We're never gonna get, leave the fossils underground if we try and fight and compete and argue over various things. Nuclear needs to be redefined to eliminate its sprawl, to design the cost, make it simple. So this is an example of a nuclear plant and behind it are some molten salt containers. And basically these are hot, hot salt and they act as batteries to use to integrate with renewables. The next slide will show you just this part of the, of the diagram of the image uh, with a with a, um, a turbine daily turbine load profile, and the company that's involved in this is called Natrium. Um, perhaps they're using um, the uh, Na for sodium, uh, but it integrates Terra Power, one of the uh, existing companies, with uh, General Electric Hitachi, another uh, company, and um, um, they're they're thinking about a 14-day period in California when they had rolling blackouts during the fires. And, and they're talking about how they could have gotten around this problem if they had used a, a small modular reactor of about 345 megawatts. Just, just thinking of one reactor here. And of course, you could have a bank of a dozen. Um, and the idea is that uh, at midnight here, um, you have a low load because most everybody's sleeping except a few people who are uh, working the midnight shift. And uh, so you um, are using whatever you can get from stored energy in these molten salt banks here. And you can continue to use that stored energy. And then you get up to about six o'clock in the morning. And um, between then and one o'clock in the afternoon, you can uh, keep your load uh, with nuclear and conserve the um, uh, some of the stored heat that you've generated from the nuclear reactor into the salt, and then use that along with the uh, 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 renewables uh, to power the late afternoon shift and the people getting home and turning on the oven and the TV, etc. So the idea is to use timing and to plan uh, an integration of nuclear and solar or wind, both, um, which I think is a not only a brilliant idea, but a way to get the people working together. Also, Thorcon has been involved, deeply involved in shipbuilding. They bought a shipbuilding company and they have this idea of uh, using the MSR technology, miniaturizing it. There are four little reactors here and that they're gonna bring over in this ship to uh, Indonesia. They've got an office now in Indonesia. The public has been much more accepting over the past 10 years. Um, with of nuclear energy. So the, some of the cool plants that were planned along the coast are going to be uh, evolving and changing their plans, I think, to nuclear as a result of the efforts by Thorcon. They use low cost shipyard block construction and uh, I'm encouraged by that. Finally, there is a, this talk about reducing the cost. They have a term FOAK. It stands for first of a kind construction. And that's been the problem up until now. We've been doing this sort of thing so that the costs are, <coughs> excuse me, $12,000 per kilowatt of electricity, kilowatt hour, something like that, or maybe kilowatt potential, uh, electric potential. And they've been working with Japan and finding that, that uh, while this was the initial cost, that they can keep the, the cost 
savings down. Can't, uh, Japan, I think, has more uniform <coughs> systems of, of, a, of an acceptance accreditation. And then when they try to use the light water shipyard technology uh, of using um, ships to transport small modular things, and then the advanced generation four shipyard technology that I just showed you, and, and then with mass production, you might get the cost down tenfold. I'm not going to justify this rather optimistic slide, except to say that people are thinking about it and claiming that it can be done. Um, I hope they're successful. Just a last couple of more slides. Given the future needs for energy, how can nuclear power help? Well, we can clearly use the small modular technology by scaling down from 1,000 megawatts to 300. New scale, one example of them, I've got $1.3 billion from the Department of Energy, so that's moving ahead. We can increase the versatility, uh, not only by reducing the size, but by now using Gen 4 technology. Here in terrestrial energy is doing this now. We can build safer by design. The sources can't melt down if they're already dissolved using the molten salt. Uh, we can, um, I call this nuclear act two, combined with renewables. Uh, there's talk about assisting space propulsion. If we must go to Mars, we can certainly save a lot of rocket fuel by using nuclear engines and they're designing those now. Um, uh, even if we don't go to Mars and just go to the moon, it might be uh, save a lot of fossil fuels to use rocket propulsion. Uh, we can integrate with steel production and water desalination, and even perhaps contribute to the development of fusion energy. Uh, so this is my last slump summarized slide from, from before, that we can use new scale and other SMRs to give us a time bridge uh, We can uh, to the Gen 4 reactors. And there are many of those, and we can um, um, find the ones that work best. A concept of floating reactors by Thorcon I find is practical, and this is a picture of that sort of thing diagrammatically. And that fission power will re reduce carbon emissions for transportation, and I'd like to talk about that next time uh, as a group, and I'll send you the link for that, or um, Christine will. So uh, fission then can help us solve our problems. We can fix fear. Uh, and that helps all of you can be involved in this. You can talk to your children and grandchildren and help them understand that we can fix poverty as well and the climate. Um, as uh, Margie uh, tried to inspire us in, in helping to develop this website. Uh, so we'll keep this website going and I invite you to look at it if you um, have more questions or feel free to email me. So thank you, uh, I invite your questions and um, Let's see here. I need to stop share. Hey, somebody's got a nice joke up there. So let's deal with, we've got four chats and one Q and A. Let's try the chat. Uh, Elon Musk asked one of his early dates. I think about electric vehicles a lot. Do you think about electric vehicles? <laughs> uh, Lee asks all panelists, I don't understand why the oil industry was trying to put down nuclear power. Oil is primarily used for transportation while nuclear is primarily stationary power as in electricity. Oil is only used for about 1% of the nation's power. So why did big oil consider nuclear power as competition? I think uh, the reason you're having a problem with that, Lee, is that um, you've taken the word oil literally. Um, when we, um, first of all, oil is often refined. The oil up in, in Canada uh, uh, is, is refined and, and as well as underground uh, into gasoline. And uh, gasoline is used uh, yeah, you're right, a lot for transportation, but I think oil also is short term for fossil fuels, includes coal, and it's the coal that is the real killer. And I think uh, the oil industry is a broad term that includes coal and any fossil fuel. Um, and so that's how the oil industry uh, is fearful, oil in the broad sense of the word is fearful of nuclear. Uh, let's see what else we have here. We have some question and answers up here. 
anonymous attendee. I'm not quite sure who this anonymous attendee is. Um, you indicated the cost of nuclear power. This person is regularly involved in economics. They will become competitive with wind and solar soon. We're all old enough to remember the original industry claims that nuclear would be too cheap to meter. Why would we believe the industry now? That is a very good question. And, and I think I can answer it this way. Um, yes, we are old enough to remember the original claims. Those claims came from, from uh, Westinghouse, um, I believe, and they um, talked to uh, the people at Oak Ridge and the Oak Ridge didn't analyze it very thoroughly. And they accepted and bought uh, the numbers from Westinghouse and to some degree General Electric and promulgated those. Uh, Weinberg was especially guilty of that and admits that in his book. Uh, uh, and he felt badly because uh, uh, that was a terrible overstatement. Um, why would we believe it now? Well, because we, as we change to, um, as, as in the slides that I showed you, and I showed you the one slide on economics, um, I'm not, I don't have the numbers there. And I can't defend the actual numbers. But to answer why would we believe the industry now, um, I think one mistake, uh, um, an overstatement uh, is not as bad as uh, all the lies that we're hearing now about COVID and everything else. It's uh, we should forgive the nuclear industry this one time and uh, accept the fact that they were wrong. I think that they can reduce it from the obvious uh, concepts of uh, uh, building smaller units that are more uh, flexible, versatile, and less costly and can be assembled on site. So that alone, I think, uh, should allow us to give uh, some credibility to the industry. Mert asks, how will major increase in the use of electricity be distributed, especially for transportation? Well, that's to be discussed next time. I uh, hope you can join us then, Mert. Um, uh, I will have some far out ideas about that. Um, as well as maybe some logical ones uh, to share with you. So let's move that question on to next week and hope that we can all attend. Alan Pentecoff writes, small reactors have been aboard ships and submarines for decades. Why did this not spread to land? What is the current state of fission power at sea? Well, it did spread to land. That was how um, um, Rickover uh, did take it from submarines and ships to land, and that's how they all became um, water-based. Um, and and the, the, that's why we've been stuck for 60 years with, with water cooling. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a problem. Um, they, we used the old marine technology on land and we didn't need to have done so. We did so because Eisenhower was in a hurry and uh, Rickover did what he figured he could do in two and a half years, and he, he accomplished it. Now the current state of fission power at sea, it's limited to, to the military. Only they have the, the, the money to do it. They've got this incredible budget and so they can build aircraft carriers and, and submarines and apparently quite a few other ships, uh, intermediate sized are now nuclear powered. We have no idea uh, how this is done. None of this is available to the public. And I think you raise a very good point, uh, Alan, that uh, we need to work with the military to uh, find ways to learn from what we the mistakes and the, the learning positives of the military over the past uh, 30 or 40 years and the Russians certainly have huge experience too uh, to um, help to, to build these uh, reactors in the bottoms of, of our big freighters so that when we unfortunately continue to buy so much stuff from China and other countries they can be coming on nuclear powered ships instead of diesel powered ships. The, um, uh, it, it's really quite incredible how much fuel is uh, consumed and CO2 emitted on the ships. Um, I'm not sure if, I don't think you were with us then, Alan, but some of us went to see the uh, wonderful display at, um, A, a neat little place on Femrate Drive uh, dedicated to Leopold. 
um, Aldo Leopold. It's a little center there. And they had gotten about a million bucks uh, came to Madison to build these phenomenal video uh, demonstrations um, that were quite global in the character and the imagery. And they showed um, a picture of all the ships uh, around the globe at any moment in time. And the oceans are full of them. Uh, it's amazing that we don't hit more whales than we do because uh, there sure are a lot of them um, plying the seas at any one time. And uh, we could sure save a lot of pollution if we could have at least most of the big ones uh, converted to nuclear. Okay, enough for Alan. I've got Mert here asking another question. The use of the term metanoite in the flop book you sent seems a bad message that naysayers need to repent their sins. Comments. Gee, I don't recall. Oh, I did send something about um, that nuclear was a flop, but I do not recall that term. I probably did not send, uh, did not read it enough before I sent it around. And I don't have any comments to make because I need to go back and look at that in more detail. We should talk about that Mer uh, some more. I, I think I need to read that, <laughs> that link a little more carefully. Alan comes on again. It is my understanding that the military uses a highly refined fuel in its ship reactors. They get more power for a longer time from a smaller fuel. Well, yes, the military people have this ability to get around a lot of civilian problems. The civilians, uh, for civilian use, were not allowed to get above 20% enrichment, and they call it low um, enrichment uranium, LEU. Uh, but the military can use HEU, which is high, um, or HUE, I guess, <laughs> high uranium enrichment, uh, one or the other. In any case, they can go up to 80 or 90% without any trouble. And that's what you mean by um, uh, highly refined. It's, it's refined in the sense that it's enriched. And they get more power for a longer time from a smaller fuel. Yeah, they're, they're, that's true. Um, and uh, I think we should be able to do that perhaps too, although that's a scary thing because when you get above 20%, uh, you start to get up toward bomb grade material and we are all uh, par very paranoidal about uh, uh, bombs, nuclear weapons, since that's how, how it all started. And I think the main reason why we're having a trouble with the word nuclear. So I'm not sure we could get all the way up to the level of enrichment that the military use, but we can certainly get a lot higher than the three to 4% that we're using today, I think, in our reactors. So you make a good point. Your comments on the plans to build 235 new gas owned power plants. Um, I'm not sure. Plans to build 235 new gas powered plants. I'm not aware of that. Uh, maybe that's Oh, it's in chapter 12. Um, we, we need to work Mert, on a direct thing. I'm not even sure what chapter, uh, what book we're talking about that I sent around. And I'm sorry, but I'm gonna have to answer that one-on-one uh, um, -on -one with you because I, I'm just not sure. Um, I don't recall the 235 new gas powered plants. So let's, let's deal with that directly one-on-one. -on -one. Um, Doug Edwards asks all panelists, can you comment on the potential pathological effect of using the land contaminated by the Fukushima event, eating food grown there, living there, eating food and liquid stored there? Um, and that's sent out to all panelists. Um, that's a good one. I. I'm most familiar with the water that they use. They've stored all the water um, for decommissioning or not so much decommissioning, but just cooling down the reactors. And I think there are 10,000 huge containers of uh, tritiated and otherwise contaminated water that they're worried about. Uh, the public seem to be worried about the tritium much more than the cesium. Cesium worries me a bit more, 
although fortunately there's not too much of that, but it, it's, uh, it's a more long lasting and much more dangerous um, fission product. Um, so far as the land is concerned, I think uh, the, the, they're dealing so much with a certain amount of waste and the water that I'm not sure that they're gonna do very much with the land. As, as I understand it, um, they'll be testing it, the food grown there. And uh, a lot of people uh, did, uh, were forbidden to, to consume uh, the vegetables in their gardens. I think that needs to be worked out with a change in the laws. Um, as you know, the linear no threshold hypothesis um, has been taken seriously by TEPCO and the restraints put upon the Japanese people, I think are at least 10 times, if not 100 times overblown. Um, somebody with some good international clout needs to go in and look at that and see uh, when those people can uh, do that. But I have no personal experience, nor have I read uh, that much about when that can be done and if it's even feasible to change some of those rules, which would uh, make it a lot easier. Um, the problem is that the back, people are talking about using limits that are just a little bit above background radiation. And the question is, uh, what are our levels of background radiation? And how much higher can we go? Um, most people think that radiobiologists, that we can go 10 to 100 times higher than our background radiation and still be quite healthy. Um, others would say even higher, and that level is not yet determined. Um, Doug Edwards says, what do you know from your experience and training? Uh, well, now you're going to promote a personal thing. The very first day that I was accepted into a radiation oncology residency program, in the Bronx of New York at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. I have been working, of course, with mice and doing some radiation of mice. And so I was familiar with small volumes of small amounts of radiation. Uh, we used a cesium unit to irradiate, give mice whole body radiation, things like that. Anyway, when my first day talking about personal experience, I was told that there was a very obese patient with uterine cancer and she was too big to get into the operating room and have her uterus removed. And therefore we would need to treat her with radium. And I don't mean radiation, I mean the isotope radium. And there's a way, we don't use radium anymore in hospitals, but back in the old days when I was in training, we did, and we put these radium in special things called Heyman capsules. And they had little numbers on the ends of wires. And we packed this woman's, under anesthesia, of course, her uterus just full with radium plugs. And so we, and me in particular, as a junior resident, were exposed to a lot of um, radium for a couple of hours while we packed this woman's uterus. To the best of my knowledge, she did well and her cancer resolved and my fingers are still here. So uh, they didn't seem to mind that exposure on the one day. I think that uh, chronic exposure though, uh, is a problem, and it's been known that radiologists uh, back about 100 years ago were starting to use x-rays uh, generated from um, and, and, and evaluated through fluoroscopes. And every morning when the doctors who were not called radiologists back then, 100 years ago, um, they would warm up their x-ray fluoroscope equipment in the morning and test it by putting their hand in front of the fluoroscope. And, um, and then they go ahead and take x-rays on people with sprained ankles and broken wrists and so on all day long and then shut it off at night. And after a few months of this daily, five day a week uh, testing of the equipment, uh, some of these early um, doctors, uh, proto radiologists, developed skin cancers of their hands that they put in front of these units. And these skin cancers were very malignant and metastasized to the lungs and killed them fairly quickly. And I read a book and even wrote an essay when I was in medical school 
on these martyrs of radiation. It's interesting that uh, Conrad Röntgen always wore a lead apron. He had the good sense to protect himself from these mysterious rays that he thought might have some damage and he was right and cautious. So chronic use uh, by people in the profession uh, is, a, is a danger. And that applies, of course, to um, um, eating food grown there and uh, the contaminated land around Fukushima. I, I um, agree that that is a, a problem. To the best of my knowledge, nobody has died yet. They've seen a few cases of thyroid cancer, but not apparently significantly above background. Um, they have also, in Hiroshima, looked at the progeny of the next generation and 77,000 survivors of Hiroshima and not found any genetic influences at all. So there's no evidence of transmission of radiation damage through the genes of Hiroshima survivors. But um, uh, that's my personal knowledge. It's not as much perhaps as uh, you might like to know, but uh, that's about it. Let's see if we, okay. Yeah, Mert says, okay. <laughs> so we'll get in touch. Carol Reeder says, what has been the ecological recovery at Chernobyl? What is the genetic damage there? Um, your questions are interesting because they show that you're interested in the science of radiobiology um, more than in the acceptance of nuclear energy, which is fine. I appreciate both. Um, my talk was mainly aimed, of course, at uh, generating electricity safely and eff efficiently. But uh, I'm happy to share with you what I still remember of, uh, of the uh, radiobiological problems. Um, I think many of us saw a movie about the wildlife in Chernobyl. They're apparently thriving as are very ardent religious followers um, who still live there uh, by religious followers. I'm talking about humans. Um, uh, I think the um, uh, Russian form of Christianity, um, very dedicated. These people come to their churches and uh, their pictures of some priests and the loyal elderly people coming there. I don't recall seeing any young ones in the movie, but they did have a movie of, of the area around Chernobyl and the towns. Obviously, the, the area very close to the bomb to the uh, explosion, I mean, um, had been filled in and covered over by a giant concrete sarcophagus. And uh, there still, I think, are some con contaminated areas that they need to clean up. But I believe that uh, uh, the area is gradually being repopulated both by people and by wildlife. The wolves apparently are thriving because there's nobody around to kill them off. and uh, they living in a nice balance with nature. So um, I think since nobody is, is showing any signs of radiation illness and Russia has other things to do and there are not many people clamoring for um, reconstruction, reparation and cleaning up uh, and there's no airborne distribution of radiation anymore. Um, it's just, uh, going to be a footnote in history, I believe. Um, there used to be a woman here in Madison who was very, very interested in cleaning up things in Chernobyl. And uh, I met her and we went to some meetings together. She's been gathering a lot of money together and sending it over and actually visiting Chernobyl to help the people there in the area who were suffering. And I'm, I'm very impressed by her concern for these unfortunate people. But I think that is um, um, settled down to the best of my knowledge. I've not heard of, of uh, any other details than that movie that we many of us saw on television a few years ago. And I think it focused mostly on the wolves. Um, but that was, uh, I'd like to know more about it. And if you folks do learn more about Chernobyl, by all means, share it with me. And uh, we can continue to talk about that. Next week, um, we are going to have uh, a general discussion, a group discussion about transportation. 
And I think Lee has agreed to talk to us about, uh, as I mentioned, about the recent meeting in Chicago. I am going to talk a little bit about some meetings that I went to in California about innovative aviation. Um, but I think we can plan to talk also about uh, um, some other things. For example, I've traveled in Europe, uh, particularly in France, but also uh, north of Paris as well as south on the TGV, which stands for Très Grande Vitesse. Um, that's electric powered trains on very smooth railways that are welded, not spiked together. And the trains go at uh, a couple of hundred kilometers an hour. Um, you can uh, have a glass of wine and put it on the table in front of you and it hardly vibrates at all. And that electricity, 80% of it comes from nuclear reactors. So it's pretty clean electricity as opposed to coming from coal and gas. And uh, so that's one way that the France has improved. They have a unique country in that Paris is sort of like the center of a spider's web. And people um, can go through this hub out to visit uh, the castles on the Loire or the chateaus and the tour and things like that in a matter of minutes on these fast trains and uh, uh, not consume or emit too much carbon. So that's a nice thing. Unfortunately, it's not so easy to do in this country. Um, I'm not sure if Elon Musk is gonna come up with that wonderful loop. Anyway, we can discuss all of those things next week. So I hope you'll all get on the um, uh, special link that Christine is gonna be sending out. And if you have any problems finding it, let me know and I will uh, get it out to you too. Um, so we look forward to seeing you all next week. And I wanna thank you for your good questions. Sorry, I wasn't able to answer some of the radiobiological ones uh, very well. And I haven't made a big study of, of Fukushima or Chernobyl, but um, I wanted to focus more on the positive aspects of nuclear energy than the mistakes. And unfortunately we have had uh, uh, some of those and they do dwell in our minds, especially when they have uh, long-term consequences. So I wish you a good week and look forward to our last session also, I'd like you to share with me any subjects that you'd like me to cover uh, next spring. We plan to start in late February as usual. I have already purchased three books uh, for reviewing and plan to invite the marine biologist that was suggested by Dr. Desai last week. And if you know of other people we might want to invite, please do share that with me. So have a good week and we'll see you then, I hope. Bye-bye. 19 attendees, great. Okay, we'll close off, folks.